Okay, welcome back everybody. Welcome to our first lecture on deformation. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. I will hope you are. Okay, let's play from current slide. Ooh. Okay, so let's talk about deformation. So I have a couple of bullet points um, on this lecture, and again, um, go back on this lecture in your own time and go back, read the pictures again um, in a little bit more detail, but I'm just going to give you a very brief synopsis of what you should know. Okay, so I have a whiteboard here, so we're going to try to get fancy. So the first thing, deformation, what is it? Okay, deformation are the changes that a rock experiences, and this is often easy to see. Okay, so in this um, slide here, you have some nice horizontal strata. This is how they were deposited in horizontal layers. And then something happened to these layers where now they are bent. Okay, so now they're nice folds that are in the rock. Okay, this is evidence of deformation, right? Something happened to these rocks to deform them. Okay, rocks don't form in these wavy layers like this. Okay, something must have deformed them for them to be like this. Okay, so let's take a look at um, a couple of other types of deformation and how we can get deformed rocks. Okay, so in the previous slide, you saw some nice folds similar to this one in the bottom right hand corner of this slide. Okay, this is a type of deformation. You can also get um, faults. You can, um, that's another way you can deform rocks. Okay, so in this um, image here, you see a nice um, fault zone of two rocks being faulted. In the top picture, you see a rock being tilted, right? So our horizontal layer is now been tilted upright. Okay, so these are all different types of deformation. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. How do we get deformation? Back to our whiteboard. Let's talk about stress and strain. Okay, so the first one, stress. Stress is the direction and the amount of force applied to an area. Okay, so all rocks, when they're being deformed, are feeling some type of stress. Okay, they're either being compressed and compacted together like this, um, say in collision zones um, in our convergent plate boundaries, for example, right? They're being compressed, they're colliding with one another, okay? They're experiencing a compressional amount of stress, okay? Rocks, as you know, can also be pulled apart, right? So in our divergent settings, our extensional settings, rocks can be pulled apart from one another, right? And then in our last um, type of tectonic setting, we can have shear, right? So rocks can rub against each other like this, right? They're not being compressed or pulled apart, but they're kind of shearing like this, okay? All three of these are different types of stress, okay? So we can walk through each one of these, um, through these pictures here, right? We have compression, Okay, rocks are coming together and being shortened and compressed. Okay, rocks are also being pulled apart and extended. Okay, and as you extend, you're thinning them out, right? When you compress, you're squeezing and making them thicker. Okay, shear, our last type of stress is when you take two rocks and you shear them like so. Right, and you can think of a deck of cards, right? You're sliding those deck of cards like so, you're shearing them, okay? And it's the same type of stress that you can apply to rocks too. Okay, so these are our type, three types of stress. These types of stress will give us a specific type of strain. Okay, so I'm just gonna move myself out of this corner so you can see, okay? In this slide, we have a little undeformed brachiopod, our little fossil friend, okay? And this is what it looks like when it is undeformed. When it's deformed or strained, and it's experiencing a type of stress um, such as compression, okay, you're gonna get this contraction here. You're going to compress and contract. You're going to thicken that brachiopod right in the center, okay? In the top, 
you have the brachiopod being stretched. It's being elongated, right? So that brachiopod is being pulled apart and stretched and elongated. Okay, and then in our last picture, we have our brachiopod being sheared, right? So you can imagine um, one end of the brachiopod is being sheared in the exact opposite. So again, I have to practice being backwards here. But if you have a square, there you go, and then you shear it like so. Okay, and that's what our last picture of our brachiopod is here, right? So the amount and the direction of stress will give you a specific type of strain or deformation, right? So stretching, elongation, type of stress will give you a stretched or an elongated brachiopod, okay? So it's kind of common sense, right? The type of stress will give you a specific type of deformation. Okay, so let's keep on going. Okay, so the third, I'm gonna put myself in the center here. The third thing we want to learn is the types of deformation. So I think you can see this here. Our third bullet, or fourth bullet, deformation type. So we have brittle or ductile deformation. So back a couple weeks ago now, we talked about um, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, right? And the hotter you go, um, the more pressure you apply to a rock will determine if you have a sedimentary rock versus a metamorphic rock, right? So the hotter the temperature, the greater the pressure, um, the greater the grade of metamorphic rock you will get. Um, the lower the temperature, the lower the pressure. Um, when you form a rock through diagenesis, you will usually get a sedimentary rock. Okay, so let's take that same idea of increasing temperature and pressure and apply it to deformation. Okay, so when you have a relatively low temperature, low pressure condition, you're going to get a brittle type of deformation. If you have a relatively warm and large pressure gradient, you're going to get a ductile type of deformation. So you can think of this as, let's say, um, a piece of caramel or um, a piece of taffy, right? If you put that piece of caramel in the refrigerator or the freezer for a little while, you're going to freeze. You're going to make that piece of caramel really, really cold. If you take it out of the freezer and you try to break that caramel apart, it's going to pretty much snap right in half, right? But if you take that caramel and you put it in the microwave for just a couple seconds and you get it a little bit warm, then you take that same caramel and you try to pull it apart. It's going to pull apart like taffy. Okay, so that's the difference between brittle and ductile deformation. Um, when you have a rock that is cooler um, and doesn't have a lot of pressure on it, you're going to get brittle deformation. So in this picture here, you see a plate being shattered, right? That's what you can associate um, brittle deformation with. You're fracturing it. You're shattering. You're breaking the rocks. Okay, whereas if you have ductile um, deformation, that's going to be your hotter temperatures, your greater pressures, right? So you can think of a piece of dough being flattened by a very thick um, geology book, right? Those are going to be our ductile deformation. The rock is going to flow instead of break. Okay, so those are our two types of deformation. Okay, so let's look at some brittle types of structures. Okay, the first one that we have are joints. Okay, and joints are planar rock fractures without any offset. So what do I mean by offset? So I have a very beautiful piece of garnet um, schist here. It's been polished like so, a nice rock slab. And then I have a very cool uh, growth of the prehistoric time scale book here. Okay, and these are going to represent our two rocks here. Okay, so if we, we'll pretend that these, this book and this rock are once upon a time, one rock um, at one point, right? And that rock breaks, okay? And we'll say it fractures, it has a fault into it, okay? It breaks and it slips, okay? When that book moved or when that rock moved, right? Now we're creating a fault zone. It slipped a little bit, right? And I'll do that again. So here's our uh, rock that's breaking or it's faulting, 
right? In this book, this part of the our rock has a certain amount of displacement to it, okay? So joints are planar rock fractures without any offset that develop, right? So you're really just breaking the rock, not moving it at all, okay? The fun stuff is when we get to faults. Okay, now faults are when you're actually breaking the rock and then moving it um, to some degree in a certain direction. Okay, so let's look at, oh, here's my favorite, um, San Andreas Fault. Okay, that's a good one. So you should all learn what that fault means and where it is. Okay, so fault movement. Let's talk about faults really quickly. Okay, so I don't really know where to put my little camera. I'll just move it around. Okay, so when we're describing fault offset, we want to talk about two things. Actually, I'm going to move it here for now. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Okay, so we want to talk about strike and dip because we have two different types of faults. We have strike slip fault and we have dip slip fault. Okay, so we'll go back to our rock outcrop here. Okay, and so you can imagine that this rock outcrop, if you submerge it in water, right, it's going to get a water line on it. And you can see that water line right here on this diagram. Okay, if you submerge this rock in water, you're going to get a water line on it. That's going to be your strike line. Get out of here. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so you're going to have a water line. That's going to be your strike. Okay, now if you imagine the same rock outcrop and you pour some water on this face of the rock, which way do you think the water is going to go? With gravity, right? So the water is going to drip down this side of the rock face. Okay, that's your dip direction. Okay, so when we talk about faults and we talk about rocks and we say, um, a fault is a strike slip fault versus a dip slip fault. We're really saying, okay, here's now our broken rock. If the rock, oh my gosh, backwards is so hard. Okay, here we go. If the rock slips in the strike direction, right, it's going to go along that strike line. So it's going to go this way or this way, right along that watermark. Try that again. There we go, this way or this way. Okay, if the fault is a dip-slip fault, right, the rock is going to slip in the direction of dip. So it's either going to go down or it's going to go up. Okay, so that's the difference between strike-slip, there we go, that's better, and dip-slip. Okay, again, strike-slip, there we go, dip-slip. Okay, so that's the two difference between strike slip and dip slip. Okay, and here's another picture of that. Okay, so um, let's look at a couple different faults. Okay, so a normal fault is when you have uh, tension or extension and the hanging wall moves down relative to the foot wall. So you can picture yourself, um, and this is a nice picture showing this, um, a fault going right through a rock outcrop, right? This is going to create a type of diagonal fault pattern going straight through the rocks like so, right? Now, if you were to build a tunnel right through that fault system that you have right here, looking at this picture, you have a hanging wall block and a foot wall block, right? This is going to play an important part in two um, different types of faults that you can have, right? So a hanging wall is where your head would be in the tunnel. The foot wall is where your feet would be in the tunnel. Okay, so let's go back to our types of faults here. When you have a normal fault, your hanging wall, again, that's where your head is, foot wall, where your feet are, your hanging wall is going to slide down relative to your foot wall, okay? So this is our fault, our normal fault. Our hanging wall is going to move down like so, 
okay? In a reverse fault, our hanging wall is going to go up, like so, okay? So the difference between moving down in normal fault and then moving up in a reverse fault. Okay, so those are our two major types of dip slip faults. Okay, again, normal fault, and I have some nice um, outlines of the faults here. Dip slip, uh, reverse fault, and then a thrust fault is really the same as a reverse fault. It just has a slightly lower angle um, of these two fault blocks. Okay, so again, normal, reverse, and then re um, thrust fault is the same as reverse. It's just a slightly different angle. Okay, so it's which way the fault block is moving. Is it being thrust up in a thrust fault or is the hanging wall sliding down in a normal fault? Okay, and then our last type of fault um, is not a dip slip fault, but it's a strike slip fault. Okay, and again, that was our first demonstration, our strike slip fault is when the rock is moving along, oh, there we go, along the strike line. Okay, so is it moving left? Is it moving right? Okay, whereas dip slip, up or down, up or down. Strike slip, left or right, left or right. Okay, and there are some really nice, um, animations on this as well just to drive that home okay so strike slip fault strike slip faults are really um, better viewed in a map view okay so um, the san andreas fault in california really nice um, map view um, formations that you can see okay so just some a couple more diagrams of strike slip okay um, and then the last thing we want to talk about in types of deformation is ductile. Okay, so remember that's when the rock is nice and warm, it's plastic, it's flowing. Okay, and you're going to take those same types of stress that we talked about earlier, right? Remember compression, um, tension, and shear, right? And you're going to apply that to these rocks, but now these rocks are going to be hotter. So they're going to behave a little bit differently. They're not going to break into a fault, but now they're going to flow. Okay, so the most famous types of structures that you're going to see in ductile deformation are these nice folds here. Okay, so when you have a rock that's being compressed, okay, you're going to get um, really nice folds. Okay, so I'll see if I can do a demonstration on the fly. Okay, so here we go. Let's see. I have a piece of paper here. Okay, I'm going to apply pressure to it. So I'm squeezing this piece of paper. Okay, that piece of paper is creating a nice fold, like so. Again, I will get better at this backwards stuff. Okay, I'm applying pressure to this piece of paper. I'm creating a nice fold, like you see here. Okay, and folds can either be in this structure here, which is what we call an anticline, or they can fold down. Again, I'm applying pressure, it's just folding in the other direction. And this is called a syncline. Okay, anticline, syncline. Okay, and here's um, some more detail on what that looks like. Okay, so here's a fold. You're generating folds. Here's a nice anticline on the side of the road. Again, anticline, you can think, um, associate the shape A. The letter A is anticline. And then you have a U-shaped, which is our syncline. Okay, monoclines are another type of fold that forms due to compression, um, but it doesn't have an exposed fault to it. Okay, so we have our fault um, hinge here, our limbs in our ductile deformed folds. Our monocline has a little fold, our fault coming up, but it doesn't expose itself um, at the surface. So it's not quite an anticline or a syncline. It's just this kind of stair step fold that you see here. Okay, you can also get basins and domes um, forming from compression. 
So this is our ductal deformation that we have with compression. Um, the same type of force that I am using to make this fold here, you can do with a basin, except now you're applying pressure on all sides. So I'm creating this basin or dome structure like so. Okay, so again, you're applying pressure, you're applying compression, and you're creating these domes, these folds, um, these wavy features. This is all from compression. Okay, um, a ductile formation you can get from stretching or elongation or tension, whatever you want to call it, are these things called boudins. Um, boudins is a German word for sausage, so they look like sausage links, which is what this picture um, shows really nicely. And boudins are when you have a horizontal layer, like so you see in this um, diagram here at the bottom, and you stretch it out, right? And you're going to stretch it out um, so much that the layers are going to start to separate from one another. Okay, so you can see that there is this tail in between these boudin structures, right? That's the elongation, the stretching um, of these um, strata. Okay, so that's what happens when you stretch ductally, okay? And then the same type of deformation in um, ductile structures with shear are myelinites. And myelinites, you can imagine, um, look like a shear zone, um, but ductally. So you can imagine that the rock is being pulled apart in one direction and pushed in another direction. Okay, it's going to get this kind of... Um, wavy, smushy zone right in the middle of that ductal gear zone. Okay, and here's some nice um, YouTube videos on that. Okay, so now we can put it all together, right? We have compression um, at our brittle zone in our fault, creating our um, thrust faults or our reverse faults. Okay, it's also going to give us our folds. Okay, in tension or extensional settings in our brittle deformation style, we get normal faults, okay? And at our ductal deformation style, we get um, boudins or we get stretching. Okay, and then lastly, we have a our shear zones, okay? And at shallow zones, that's gonna be our strike slip faults, our transform plate boundaries. At deeper sections, that's gonna be where we have our um, myelinites are shear zones. Okay, so this is a really nice diagram to show you the type of faults we get and the type of ductile formations that we get depending on the stress. Okay, so each type of stress is going to give us a different type of fault and it's going to give us a different type of um, ductile formation. Okay, so this is a really nice diagram that shows us that. Okay, and then the last thing I want to say before we wrap up, again, here's some nice Diagrams, okay, so we talked about three types of stress and strain. We talked about three major types of faults, and we talked about three plate boundaries. Okay, so are we sensing a pattern here? I think so. We can attribute each type of stress and strain, each type of fault to a specific plate boundary. So I'm just going to walk us through there's always a couple of exceptions in life and in everything. Okay, here we go. Deformation at plate boundaries. Okay, so here are some um, nice diagrams of the different types of faults that you'll expect at these plate boundaries. Again, you have our normal faults in our extensional um, elongation type of stress. We have our um, reverse or our thrust faults happening in our compression. So these are going to be our convergent plate boundaries. And then you have a strike slip fault or transform plate boundary. Okay, and this is going to happen at our transforms, so our St. Andreas fault types of plate boundaries. Okay, again, the difference between divergent plate boundaries, convergent, and transform. Okay, and we're almost done. Here are some nice um, diagrams of each of these plate boundaries and what you can expect to find at each plate boundary. Okay, so you'll have normal faults, um, boudins, stretching, and thinning of the crust. Okay, these are all going to happen at divergent plate boundaries.
Okay, something that um, is an exception to the rule with pl divergent plate boundaries is you will find some transform plate boundaries, right? And we talked about that quite a bit, right? So plate boundaries um, are not these perfect squares. They're uneven. Okay, and so here we go. As our plates are being pulled apart from one another, right, you get these divergent boundaries here. like so, but where you have these stair step patterns, you're going to have a transform plate boundary right along the edge, like so. Okay, so that's the only exception to the rule. You're going to have a couple of transform plate boundaries in divergent plate boundaries, okay? But um, don't be too confused, ignore it if you have to, to get through it. Okay, some more um, examples. Convergent plate boundaries, you're gonna have reverse or thrust faults. You're gonna have folds. Okay, so these are all in convergent compressional uh, plate boundaries. You're gonna compress and thicken the crust. Okay, a couple real life examples. And then transform plate boundaries are pretty self-explanatory. You're gonna have strike slip faults. You're gonna have myelinites or shear zones. And the crust is neither gonna thick nor thin in this type of scenario, okay? The crust is gonna stay relatively the same thickness. Nice diagram of summary of faults um, in some videos, please watch those. So go through the YouTube videos in this lecture, go through these again, um, just so you can get it in your head. Um, and that's really it. I hope this was um, short enough. If not, I'll try to make the next one even shorter. Um, okay, and stay tuned for our next lecture.